Perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Are we now recording? I think we are. All right. Now I have to stop making a fool of myself. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. There are two things to keep in mind here this evening, folks. The first of them is that you don't need to go to a prestigious institution for great things to happen, for you to gain the most from your college education. And the second thing to keep in mind is that what you do in college will be more important than where you go. And it's usually at this point in the conversation where we're in a room together at Bethesda Chevy Chase High School, we're all sitting there high-fiving, seeing each other without masks on pre-pandemic, where I ask this question. Parents in the room, please raise your hand if the most important thing you learned or gained from college happened inside the classroom. Oftentimes, when I ask that question, you'll see a couple of hands go up, but for the most part, they don't. And it's not because your parents didn't go to class. They all did. They all went to class. They, they got their degrees and they sit here now. Or they didn't go to college and they recognized it was unnecessary for them. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because the best parts of college, the things that are most important, rarely happen in one specific class or in the classroom. It tends to be the research you gain because of a connection with the professor, the internship you got because of the work you put into the classroom, the people you met and networked with that helped you get your first job after your four years at that school. There is no denying it that if you do, if you look at it for pound to pound, the opportunities coming out of Yale will be more plentiful than the opportunities coming out of Coastal Carolina. But if you don't believe me when I say that the really important things happen uh, outside the classroom. Folks, those of you joining us, can you please go ahead and mute yourselves? We'd appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, the most important thing isn't about the school. It's about what you gain from that institution. And to that point, if you don't believe me, maybe you'll believe Malcolm Gladwell, who did uh, a, a recording called Zeitgeist on that they posted on YouTube that's about 23 minutes long, where he talks about that very piece, about how students go to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, these highly selective institutions every year, and they come out with almost nothing to show. Because that student who might have been top of his class at Walter Johnson, at BCC, at Richard Montgomery, at Wooten, goes to a school where everyone else is as strong or stronger. And rather than being able to sit at the top, they're now sitting in the middle. They're struggling to keep up their classes when usually it was easy to them. And now, rather than being the best at it, they're in the middle and they can't cope with it. It's something brand new to them. So, so much of this process, folks, is about knowing yourself, knowing what you need to be successful. And for the students who focus on what I need to be successful is the name of the school, those are the students who very rarely end up standing out to an MIT, very rarely to a Yale, very rarely does the kid who says, I have to go to an Ivy League to be successful, end up getting into an Ivy League. It's usually the student who recognizes they can be successful anywhere, but takes advantage of all the opportunities given to them throughout high school. So let's define what a highly selective college is. For many people, it's an Ivy League. And they think, well, you know, Cornell is my top choice, but I'll, I'll settle for Duke. That'll be my backup. But that's not the case anymore. Schools like Duke, schools like UCLA, schools like even University of Michigan or Northeastern or Northwestern, Washington University, St. Louis, these are highly selective institutions. In fact, for most of the people on this call, since you live in the state of Maryland, University of North Carolina is a highly selective institution. Why? Because any given year, they only take about 18% of their incoming class from outside of North Carolina. So that means that 18% of their class is coming from all over the world and the other 82% from North Carolina. I'm not trying to urge anybody on this call to move to North Carolina tomorrow to go to UNC, but you need to understand the landscape of things, especially now that test scores have gone the way of the dinosaur for many schools. We're noticing that more schools are falling to this highest selective category than they did five years ago, than they did 10 years ago. I'm sorry, this is such a disaster. So to that point, I hope you all understand that the schools that we focus on today are going to be those highly selective schools. And the information I share with you might scare you, but my goal here isn't to put fear in it. It's to help you understand the realities and the difficulties of getting into these institutions and what you can do to stand out among your peers or with your peers. So to that point, highly selective schools are schools that accept 20% or fewer of their student body. They're ones where your grades and your test scores don't get you in. If anything, they keep you standard strong. And it's rare that I can look at a single student and say, you know what, this year, I think your chances of getting to Northwestern are really good. Harvard, it's, it's a no doubt. The point of a highly selective institution is that you can work as hard as you want. But that doesn't mean you're getting in. It just means that you're a qualified candidate to that school this year. 
So oftentimes I get the question, well, what do I need to do? Like, I remember last year's key club president went to Yale. Do I need to be the key club president? No, this isn't baking. This isn't a, you need to put in two pitches of salt, a half teaspoon of baking soda, and voila, you're the best cookies. This is more like cooking. It's an art form. Put in what makes you happy. Use the spices that you enjoy. And end of the day, by pursuing those interests and those passions, you will look better on paper and in person to those schools than the kid who tried to do it the more formulaic route, who joined key clubs solely because last year's president went to Yale, or who decided to pursue an activity because they heard that colleges like it. There is no magic formula. Quite frankly, if there was, I imagine we all would have paid the $10,000 or whatever whoever had it was charging to get it, right? But what schools are looking for is simple. They want you. They want somebody who is unique, who is different, who is individualistic, who's hardworking, who's likable, all things we're gonna cover throughout this webinar. So to really get into this, you need to understand what it's like to be the person reading your application. My colleague Arun Panamasamy is probably the best person I can lean on to kind of give you a sense. He worked in the Caltech admissions office. And I love the way that he framed it. He said one year that he would sit there for weeks on end reading applications. And after two weeks, there would be a couple of kids that he just looked at and said, these kids have to come here. I love these kids' applications. They'd be phenomenal fits here. These 10 students need to be admitted. And then he'd go back to the committee all the counselors come together and the director of admissions says, this year we're going to have a 10% admit rate. So he now looks at these 10 applications that he, after pouring through hundreds, he has 10 that he loves. And when he hears that 10%, he realizes one of those 10 is coming to his school this year. Maybe two if another gets deferred and gets in regular decision down the road, but only one of these 10, and these 10 were of hundreds that he's already read, are going to get in this year. Admissions officers are not looking for reasons not to like you. They're not sitting behind a wooden mahogany desk, uh, sitting there with a corn cob pipe thinking about how you don't have enough to bring to the institution. It's actually the opposite most of the time. Most people don't know this, but the average admissions officer is about 25 years old. They're closer to your age as a high school student than they are to your parents' age. Yet, we always think about that person who might be sitting at Harvard for the past 40 years or at Georgetown and that how they've been the director of admissions for 30 years and think that that's what all admissions officers are like. But in all reality, it's usually a kid who just recently graduated who wants to help impact the school's next admitted class. So to that point, admissions officers aren't looking to dislike you. They're not looking to kind of find faults in your application. They're looking for the many reasons to like you, to bring you there. But to that point, the schools we are talking about today, any little thing on your application that they might find as either an inconsistency, a red flag, a question, can have an impact. Because for the most selective schools out there, admissions officers aren't going to take the risk. Many schools out there, they'll take a risk. A kid had a bad 10th grade, but they bounced back in 11th grade. You know what? Let's try it out. Let's give them a shot. Because they're obviously a good student and good kid. But for your Harvards, your Cornells, your Dartmouths, your MITs, your Caltechs, your UC Berkeley's and UCLA's, they aren't gonna take the risk because they have so many good and qualified candidates out there that they don't have to take a risk anymore. They don't have to say, why not give them a shot even if they had that bad 10th grade semester. Many of these schools are called be free for a reason. The applicants who get in have the most rigorous course schedule they can and maintain all these throughout. And not everybody can do that and that's okay. But for the students who tend to get into these schools, oftentimes it's what they're looking at. So there are two realities here, folks. Not everybody gets in and your grades and test scores are just a standard. They don't get you in anymore. 30 years ago, 1600 meant maybe an Ivy League would happen just because of your score. But now grades and test scores are what we call the baseline. The standard strong is the terminology they use. A test score of 1380 doesn't get you in. It just means that you're below the baseline of what they're looking for in that year. So what we're going to focus on through the rest of this uh, webinar is you understanding what they are looking for outside the grades and the test scores. So what I'm going to do here before we get into some of the qualities that these schools are looking for is I'm going to pause and take a look to see if there are any questions in the chat box. Kate or anybody from the CAC, can you chime in and let me know if there's any questions I can answer at this time? There's just one um, about how important it is, which kind of classes you're taking the fall semester of your senior year. So I'm not sure if that's something you're gonna cover um, as you go through the presentation. 
Great question. It is something I will be covering down the road. So please bear with me. I promise I will get to that. Great question. So let's go ahead and let's dive in. Before you is what we call the magic pill, the five qualities and characteristics that these institutions tend to look for from every applicant. And let's make something very clear. They're not looking for one or the other. They like to see all five of these. Passion, initiative, individuality, love of learning, and likability all play into what these colleges are looking for from their incoming class. And don't forget, they're going to be looking for geographic diversity, ethnic diversity, diversity in majors, diversity in interests, and everything in between. So what they're looking for is not just a valedictorian, that seems even a salutatorian. What they're looking for is the people who are going to help complement each other at their institution. And Princeton's a perfect example. Two years ago, Princeton stated that they received enough valedictorian applications to fill up two and a half classes worth of Princeton incoming class. So if they just wanted valedictorians and nothing else that year, they would still have to deny a class and a half of valedictorians. But as the admissions rep put it, if we took nothing but, but valedictorians, well, only one of those people can be a valedictorian in their class. So what does that mean for the rest of them? It just feeds into the idea that they want diversity of their incoming class, but they want strengths among these five pillars. So let's go ahead and touch on passion. For many, passion seems like that thing where it's, oh, well, I, I worked on a passion project last summer, or I'm really passionate about, uh, about the cross or the oboe. Passion can come in many different shapes or sizes, but the true definition of passion to us as a former admissions officer is, you need that in order to thrive. And if you don't have it, you're going to find something to replace it. So let's say you play an instrument. And you love it so much that without being able to be part of the marching band right now, you're going a little crazy. So every evening from nine, from nine to 10 PM, you're in your, your garage, even though it upsets your parents playing that as loudly as you can to get your fill because you love it so much. For the lacrosse player who hasn't been able to get out there with his team until the beginning of spring, he's been out there playing wall ball every day for two hours, left hand, right hand, left hand, right hand, just working on his skills and on the weekends, there's a couple of kids in the, in the neighborhood who like to learn about it. So it goes out there and plays catch with them. Passion is something that you exude because you love it, because you need it to be part of your life. And as a highly selective uh, college, what we're looking for passion wise is, do we offer what it is that you're passionate about? If not, do I envision you being the person to bring it to this school? And even if we don't have it and you aren't gonna bring it to our school, where else can I expect you to pursue a passion of similarity at our college? So a perfect example is a student of mine formerly who went to UC Berkeley. He absolutely loved, he absolutely loved lacrosse. And while there was a club team there, there wasn't really a strong division one team or anything. That's what he was kind of looking for. But Berkeley recognized that he was 6'4", very strong, in good shape. And the crew coach came to him and said, listen, you seem like somebody who has a fervor for being part of a team. You obviously love lacrosse. What I can offer you is something different. I know you've never done crew before, but if you're willing to give it a shot, I'm willing to have you on my team. That student went to Berkeley for crew, never had done it before in his life, but they recognized his skill set, they recognized his strengths, and they recognized the passion that he had, and they showed him where he could take it, and he decided to pursue it. So here's my point, folks. You might be passionate about reading about video games, about, uh, about astronomy, about, about understanding physical sciences that I may be unaware of, right? But what I do want you to understand is that these schools need to see that passion and that can be driven through your activities. So at BCC, let's say it's something that isn't currently available to you and you have to do it within your own community. Pursue your passion to any degree you can and take the initiative to start it at BCC, to make it an option for other students. I mentioned this on a call that I did with WJ a couple of weeks ago, but one of my favorite stories is a kid who started Dungeons and Dragons Club at his school. And he didn't do it because he felt that other people need to know more about Dungeons and Dragons. He did it because he loved it so much and his two best friends who were twins moved away that he needed to find new people to play with. So on his own, he started a brand new club at his school with the understanding that some people might make fun of him for being, as he quoted, overly nerdy. So much but he didn't care about being overly nerdy. What he cared about were finding other people who wanted to quote unquote, nerd out with him. So he started a club at his school. Lo and behold, two years later, 
20 members in that club, a club that he started on his own. And at the beginning was just, as he said, embarrassing because nobody wanted to play, but he kept putting it out there in, 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 in entertaining ways. He would post little quests around campus and let people know like what it was that they were going to be doing that week. And he graduated knowing that the club he created would last because of, because of the people he found to take it on after him, what we call a lasting legacy. You'll notice below, I mentioned TED Talks, a student we worked with in Singapore, absolutely loved listening to TED Talks. In fact, she loved them so much that she contacted the folks at TED and said, listen, I would love it if there are any people in Singapore who do TED Talks, if they would come to our, to our high school. Lo and behold, over that year, they had four different people from Singapore, one a CEO of a Fortune 500 company who was in the area, another a local business person, just come to the school and talk about their TEDs, about their, about their talks, and share their information. Something that never would have happened on that campus if she hadn't taken the initiative to bring it there. I'm not sitting here trying to tell you that if there's something you love that doesn't exist at BCC, you have to make it happen. What I am telling you is that if you are truly passionate about it and there isn't currently a way for you to pursue it at BCC, look into how you can make it happen at BCC or find it within your own community. But don't say, oh, because of the pandemic, I couldn't do it because that's the last thing highly selective schools are going to want to hear because there are students out there who are finding ways, irreverent ways to pursue their passions and taking the initiative to make it happen. So a perfect example that I'd like to use here is one of my students who's interested in pursuing pre-med. She had, she had this past summer set up an, an internship at a local hospital that because of COVID she couldn't do. So while many other students fall in that same category, well, my internship's gone, so I won't do much, she took it upon herself to not only take a college course online in human anatomy and physiology, she also took advantage of the opportunity to shadow that, that doctor online every time she got the chance to. The doctor would call her sometimes at 8 a.m. say, hey, are you free? She would get online for a Zoom call and she would shadow her as the doctor carried her phone around. Now, I'm not saying that that's an opportunity everyone's going to have. But she didn't shy away from reaching back out to say, if there's anything I can do, please let me know. If there's anything I can learn, please let me know. She took the initiative to pursue her passion. So for those of you on this call thinking, I want to go to Harvard. I want to go to Princeton. I want to go to Yale. I want to go to Dartmouth and so on. Start taking heed to this because that initiative and that passion through your activities is something that they want to see screaming from your application. I'm going to pause there before we get to the third one. I see that there's a couple of questions coming in. Uh, anything that I should uh, field now, Kate, Marina, anybody else, or do you want me to keep moving forward? The, the only question that I see so far is that, um, you know, for these test optional schools or schools right now that are test optional, if you do get an SAT or ACT score, should you submit it? It's a really fair question. And again, it's something I'll cover more deeply down the road, but here's the truth of it. We live in Montgomery County. We live in Bethesda, Rockville, Gaithersburg, and areas where many students are going to have test scores. And for many, it's going to, they're going to be strong. So when admissions officers are looking at test option, one of the things they look at is, yeah, if you don't submit a test, we don't take into consideration. But if I see that there are 30 applicants from your school and 25 of those 30 did submit test scores, what it tells me is that the testing centers were plentiful. So it wasn't that you couldn't take the test. Why didn't we take it? And that's one of those question marks we talked about, right? Now, I am seeing that some schools are being far more test optional than others. And in that sense, I mean like Villanova. I'm noticing a very strong uptick in students getting in who have test scores but lower grades versus students who have great grades but no test scores. Whereas schools like Cornell, I saw a kid get in ED this year from our area who had no test scores, whereas I saw a kid not get in ED from our area with very similar numbers with test scores, right? So some schools are being far more test biased, even though they're saying that they're not. And we're going to have more data as regular decision rolls out in the next month and a half. But as of right now, I will say this. The only two reasons that I'm telling my students in this area not to test are if one, there is a true health risk. And if there is, it's absolutely something that you should let them know about in the additional information section of the common application, coalition application, whatever it may be, because it's important they know. Or two, you truly are a bad test taker. And the amount of time you'd have to spend on that test, you could put towards an activity to show this passion and initiative things we're talking about. And if I'm a highly selective institution and I see that that time was put so well into something else, I don't care about the test. But for most students, that's not what's happening. For many students to focus on, well, I don't really want to take the test. He said, I don't need it. So I'm going to continue hanging out with my friends or talking to people online or playing my video games or, or whatever it may be. And if that's the reason, then to me, it's not a good enough reason not to pursue it right now, given where we live. 
any other questions I can address before we move on to number three here? I think we can move on. Um, and I told people if they've got questions, they can put them in the chat and we'll make sure and keep that keeps track of them. <laughs> Perfect. Just want to make sure that people don't think I'm ignoring them. We will move on forward. The third quality is probably the hardest for students to really uh, exude unless they have it. And that's individuality. One of the hardest parts that we're finding for high schoolers these days is this feeling of, of individuality because it's so easy to feel like if I, if I don't do things like others, it's hard for me to make friends. And I'll tell you right now, somebody went to high school years ago, it was still like it then. If you decided that you're going to be different, sometimes it did have a feeling like, oh, well, these kids don't want to hang out with me anymore, whatever it may be. But it's where I urge you as students to remember those people that you're friends with right now, if they can't be friends with you because you can't show who you truly are, are they really your friends? It is okay to be different. It is okay to let schools know you're different and that there's something different that you bring to the table. Because quite frankly, they don't just want team captains. They don't just want the valedictorians. They don't just want the presidents of the clubs. Because if they wanted that, who'd be the treasurer? Who would be the salutatorian? Who would be willing to be the other members of that society? They want diversity. And the best way to show diversity is by opening up about who you are, what interests you. So you'll notice below, I have a couple of examples, aqua farming, flight simulation. I don't know about you, but I didn't know what aqua farming was until a student taught me a bit more about it. And to be fair, I still don't have a full grasp of all the different diversity, different ways that one can aqua farm or the diversity of the options. But what I do now know is that aqua farming is real. And I can imagine that some of you are right now on your cell phone looking up, what is aqua farming? So go right ahead. But when you're an admissions officer and you see something like that, you go, cool. You want to learn more about it. You want to learn more about that person. So for those of you on this call who like to do something that's different, who, who, who have a passion or an interest that others may not have, note that. Make that known. Pursue it. Don't just do it once and say, well, I tried this once, so I just don't know, you know I'm different. Pursue that interest and be comfortable with who you are. Now, let's make one thing very clear. Individuality doesn't mean tomorrow I'm going to go dye my hair blue because none of my friends have my hair blue. Or, you know what, I'm going to start wearing two different colored shoes because I did actually have a student start doing that thing that that's a way to be individualistic. It was, but not the right direction, right? But what it does mean is that you're okay with being different and being who you are and that you don't let other people decide what it is that you want to be. And to many selective colleges, that's important because they need to know that you're gonna pursue your path. Let's use Brown University as an example, where they have an open curriculum, where you go there with an idea or ideas of what you might wanna do, and a professor slash mentor helps you shape your path. Brown could not exist like that if they didn't attract the individuals they do. If everybody who went there just wanted to go to Brown University for the name, well, they'd have a really tough time being an open curriculum school where students graduated and did great things. But by being an open curriculum school where if you're interested in public health and astronomy and you can connect the two through your interests, you can do great things there, that's an individual. So keep that in mind as you go through this process. Like I said, I'm not expecting each of you to go ahead and do something that no one's ever done. Because quite frankly, by the, where we are now in life in the 21st century, that might be hard to do. But find the things that make you happy, that you enjoy doing, and let that set you apart from others. Yeah. William, please. The fourth quality is a love of learning. And I'm sure that as you read that, you go, well, duh, obviously I need to have good grades. But love of learning is different from good grades, folks. Love of learning is the student who decides that they're going to wake up early, not to finish homework, but because there's a book they're reading and they just have to get through it before they get to school that day or before they hop online for class. Love of learning is the student who every day that AP Chem gets out, you stay on with the teacher for five more minutes because you want to talk about something really cool you read in the textbook. Love of learning is the kid who takes AP Lit, even though they're a full STEM nerd like, like myself, and they just want to learn more about a certain literature and they love being challenged there, even though it's not their strong suit. Students who love to learn are students who take the most rigorous schedule across the board. They don't pick and choose because of their strengths. Even if it's a weakness, it's for them, it's a way to show that they're willing to grow and willing to learn. Colleges love that kid 
because the kid who loves to learn is going to be excited that they have to take astronomy in, in college yet as a requirement, or that they have to take an Eastern, an Eastern uh, European or Asian history class to meet a requirement because it's something new to learn. Now, on the opposite end is what we call the grade grubber. Grade grubbers aren't bad. They're not bad people. But the grade grubber is easy to tell between somebody who loves to learn and themselves. Because that grade grubber doesn't stay online to ask their chemistry teacher questions after class. They don't hop on early to kind of geek out about something. They don't take AP Lit because they want to. They take it because they heard they have to to go to the school that they want to. The grade grubber is the kid who asks three weeks before the end of the semester, is there any extra credit I can do to bring my grade up from a B plus to an A minus? End of the day, colleges rarely can tell the difference between a love of learning person and a grade grubber just from your grades. It's really hard because both could have straight A's, but the way that they learn is through the letter of recommendation. As you get through junior year, you're going to be hearing from your school counselor or from me now that you're going to need two letters of recommendation for many selective schools. Some schools only need one. Some schools don't even need one, right? Like ASU, they don't need a lot of recommendation. They allow for you to send one optional one if you want to, but you don't need one. But NYU, Georgetown, uh, uh, Harvard, they need to. And they're even going to have a third just so that they can see across the board how well your teachers have gotten to know you and like you. And the love of learner is the one who always gets the excellent letter. They're the one who goes to the teacher and the teacher goes, yeah, I got it, don't worry. I don't really need anything else from you. Just thank you for asking me. The grade grubber is the one who hears, sure, I can do it. Can you fill out a brag sheet for me, right? The reason being that teacher didn't really get to know you. That teacher didn't really get to connect with you either because you didn't ask questions or you worked hard, but you were kind of behind the scenes. The student who gets to know their teacher, especially their 11th grade teachers and truly takes the time to understand the material and geek out about it or ask questions or help their classmates. That's the person who gets the excellent letter. The one where the teacher talks about how they're not sure who's going to be the person who stays afterwards to kind of talk about their, their love of titrations, but they're hoping to find somebody like Jasmine again or like Jerry. That's the amazing letter of recommendation. Those are the ones that stand out to the most selective schools. Now, the question I often get right now is it's online learning. I was that student, but now that it's online, how am I supposed to do that? Like, I feel like I, my camera's off the whole time because I've been told that it's distracting, like we're not supposed to ask questions. How do I stand up? It's a super fair question. And I know that you're not gonna like my answer, but there's more time than ever to be connected with teachers. There's more time than ever to be sending a quick email saying, hey, just wanted to thank you for kind of helping, the, helping that calculus, me understand that calculus homework better. Or, wow, without your help, physics would still be another language to me. Or, wow, you weren't kidding. I loved reading Brothers Dovchayevsky. Thank you for recommending it, right? A quick note like that from time to time can be the difference maker. And even if it isn't, when they ask you to fill out that brag sheet, I like to call it a cheat sheet. I'm not telling anybody here to cheat, don't worry, but I am suggesting that as after you ask if they say yes, you provide them with a few things you loved about that class, you gained from that class, you wanted more of from that class. Because what it allows them to do when they have 80 letters of recommendation, it allows them to look at that email or that cheat sheet again and reference it in their letter. So even if you are a bit more quiet and introverted but loved a class, remind your chem teacher why you appreciate her so much, how she made it so much more understandable, how it allowed you to kind of take what you're learning and teach kids in middle school that where you were doing uh, chemistry tutoring, right? The idea about a letter of recommendation is that it exudes who you are in the classroom. Um, so and your teachers are not getting to know that right now. Help them get to know it through that direction. One more time, folks, for those of you who are on YouTube, like go ahead and mute yourself. Aqua farming as a hobby, so just like a ten thing. Sorry, folks, go ahead and uh, mm -hmm. keep people here apparently. Okay. Everyone mute themselves, please. Thank you. The fifth quality, and the one that is sometimes the most important, but the one we never think about, is likability. It is important that the admissions officers get to know you and get to like you. Because here's the truth of it, folks. If they can't get to know you from your application or they can't fall in love with you as an individual, how could they admit you over somebody who does show themselves more so, who does open up about their about what they struggled with, but how they bounce back, when they open up about kind of something that they're not good at, but how it's taught them to be more resilient. The essay is where the likability comes through. 
And many of you might be thinking, well, I was going to talk about how good I am at football in my essay, or I was going to talk about how strong of a leader I am in my essay. Well, you're already thinking about the essay in all the wrong ways. And while I'd love to spend the next hour talking solely about the essay, we'll save that for another time. But they call this the freshman year roommate test when they get to, the, to your personal statement. They have already read your application. They know the courses you took. They've read, they've, they've read through your transcript and they see and they see what you've done. They've seen your test scores if you submitted them. They've seen your activities and how deep you went. So when I get to your essay, I'm no longer asking if you're academically viable and fit for this school. I'm asking if I'd want to be your freshman year roommate. I'm asking if I'd want to spend time with you. And if you spend the next 650 words talking about how as treasurer you account for incoming and outgoing funds and how quickly you can do math in your head, Let's be honest, do I really wanna hang out with you? Probably not, maybe at MIT, right? But point being, I'm not really getting to know you, I'm getting to know a skill set of yours. Whereas the kid who talks about how they are the worst at making breakfast, when they try to surprise mom with breakfast for her birthday, they were lumpy like raw dough in the middle of the pancake, so it was awful. So instead, took, you, took her to the diner to buy her breakfast, but that later that night, you made an amazing sandwich because you're really good at making dinner. Like That's somebody who is easier to get to know. And I'm not telling you that your essay should be meaningless as that second story I just shared. What we did learn about that second story is you care. You love your mom. You're a family person and you want to give back to those who've taken care of you. So those are things that as an admissions officer, I'd rather know than more about a treasury or treasurer uh, opportunity you took on than you probably already talked about in your activities. Likeability is where you act yourself. You don't allow others' opinions of you to necessarily come into too much of an opinion because you have to analyze yourself and share who you are. And again, I'll talk about it later down the road here, but that comes out generally in your personal statement, which is the big essay that goes to most of your schools. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide and leave this here. Let me pause for a moment to answer any questions based on the qualities. So it looks like we have a couple of questions all dealing with recommendations. So for instance, um, do you need a recommendation from a teacher in a core subject or what about having them from electives, especially if you're you know, passionate about electives, if you're all about that music and you've got a music theory teacher that loved you? Great question. So you wanna be a musician, you wanna do computer science, you wanna do psychology. Yeah, AP Psych, AP Comp Sci, AP Music Theory, all good options, especially if they're in 11th grade, because you generally want two 11th grade teachers. But like I said, there should be two. So let's say you do choose your Comp Sci or Music Theory teacher, then you want the other to be from a core cur curriculum class, something like a math, a science, an English, a history. So it's okay if one of them is from the elective that you want to pursue, but I don't want your PE teacher to be the second if the first is Music Theory. Okay. And then I think you touched upon, you said the, the, the second question pertains to from what year teachers should be giving you recommendations. And you mentioned like, especially if it's like, you know, your junior year. So here's a question. If you really had a connection with a teacher, your sophomore year, you know, especially because it was live teaching versus the virtual teaching of the last year, do you go with the teacher that knows you and loves you? Or do you go with the teacher that sort of knows you virtually and still likes you? You know, what, what's the better rec in that situation? It's a tough call, right? Because I don't know the student. I don't know what teacher we're talking about. But here's what I could say from a general point of view. If there's a 10th grade teacher who it would be silly of you not to ask, do it. As long as you have at least one from 11th grade, because here's going to be their concern. There will be students with strong recommendations from 11th grade who went to school online. So why don't you have at least one? That will be the question that comes to mind. And to your this student's point, it may not be your fault. It's not your fault that coronavirus happened. It's not your fault that you may not have been able to connect while teachers online. But since others were able to, you probably want to have at least one. And if you have a 10th grade teacher who is from a subject you're interested in, who can speak so highly of you, it'd be silly not to ask. By all means, ask that one. But I don't want two from 10th grade. And then uh, just a follow up on that. Um, so we talked about core classes like English, history, science, math. What about that in between, you know, a language teacher? I know a lot of kids drop out, you know, not drop out, but like stop taking language after that. Around like spill. the third year. Yeah, okay. I mean, again, it's so leave it this way. I don't want AP Music Theory and Spanish for it. The, unless you're going to be pursuing a music and Spanish degree at my college, 
it's not going to behoove you to ask elective teachers when many of my other recommendations are coming from mostly core curriculum. The reason we like at least one from the core curriculum is it's easier for us to compare apples to apples that way. It's a lot harder, like sure, your Spanish teacher might love you and your music theory teacher might love you, but when I have a student from the same school as you getting one from the IB world teacher and the IB uh, chem teacher, it's a little bit hard for me to make the comparison because these are more rigorous courses where you still had a teacher speak this emphatically of you, whereas elective or foreign language courses sometimes are a bit hard to gauge that with. So if you decide to ask your AP Spanish 5 teacher and your history teacher, love it. One of these can be elective or foreign language. One of these should be something more core oriented. But to that point, if it's anything that's like, if it's a Spanish 3 teacher in junior year, Maybe not, but Spanish four or higher, German four or higher, then probably because it shows that you've gone that deeper route than most would have, if that makes sense. That does. And we're getting a lot more questions about recommendations and class kind of uh, difficult. So th this is where I'm going to pause people because I can't get, since we have so many people on the call, I can't get into your specific nitty gritty questions. I can speak from more of a general point of view. I know that doesn't make you happy right now, but let's keep moving forward. And if at the end there's time for me to address some, then we can do so. And okay. These are still kind of um, global questions in terms of like AP versus IB. What's the better rec or what's the, what do colleges prefer? And as well as like, if we're still talking about recommendations, are STEM area even better than humanities? Things like that. Um, so all, all of that is student dependent. That's okay. So I, I hear you, they are more globally oriented, but I can't tell you if an AP or IB would be better for you. It all depends on what you, what you connected on with that teacher, right? If you're asking me, do I prefer AP over IB or IB over AP? Generally speaking, I prefer IB over AP. I find that the IB curriculum tends to be a bit more, uh, a little less uh, general and a lot more focused. And because of that, it tends to carry a bit more weight in my eyes. But I also know admissions officers who like the APs more because there's a bit more flexibility in course schedule and creativity. So it's, it's in the eyes of the beholder there. Uh, what I can tell you is if you're gonna pursue something STEM oriented in college, you want at least one STEM -oriented oriented uh, uh, letter of recommendation. But I also loved seeing that that kid who loved engineering and got a letter of recommendation from his physics teacher also gone from his English teacher because it showed me that love of learning, right? This is where it does become more specific. So I can't necessarily say specifically what looks better. It's all based on what that student pursues, what they're interested in pursuing in college, how they did with those courses and teachers and so on. That, that's why it's a bit hard to answer that just as a one-off. So let me do this. Let me keep moving forward. If we have time at the end, I will come back to letters of recommendation, but let's kind of dive into the academic rankings and personal rankings that these schools are focusing on with each of you. On the academic front, grades, strength of curriculum, and test scores are the three things that they tend to be most focused on. Obviously, given the current circumstances, test scores are far less important than they were even two years ago. And for my class of 2022, it looks like for many of you, you may not need them again. If you have good scores, absolutely submit them. If you don't, we don't. It's just like with the APs. If you get, if you take an AP bio test and you get a two, no school needs to find out. You get a five, obviously we're gonna report it on your application to show your strength there. They're not gonna go seeking whether or not you took the SAT or took the AP because they just don't have the manpower or time to see if every student that applies did so. UCLA got 140,000 applications this year. Uh, you look at any school from Penn State to Harvard, they saw huge upticks in applications. So the time that they do have, they're focusing on the information that you've given them. To that point, it's important you understand that the strength of your curriculum is arguably more important than the grades. That doesn't mean that you should go take a full IB diploma and go shoot for Bs, because while you'll still be able to go to plenty of schools, the IVs and the highest selectors will be out of the picture. But on the same front, if you have a 4.0 and you haven't taken more than two honors courses throughout high school at a school like BCC, they're going to look at it and say, okay, well, while it's impressive you got a 4.0, their kids from your school got a 3.9 with all of these APs or IVs. So it's all about the balance. And that's where the question of does 12th grade matter comes back into play. 12th grade courses absolutely matter because here's the truth of it. Whether you're applying regular decision to my school, meaning that you aren't applying until basically uh, January 1st or later, or we defer you from early action or early decision, meaning that we need to see your first semester grades of senior year to make a decision, they want to know what courses you're taking. And on the common application, they ask you, 
what are your most recent year courses? They want you to list what you're taking in 12th grade so they can see what your ninth through 11th grade courses were in grades and know what you're taking in 12th grade. So yes, the course rigor matters and the grades matter, especially in first semester. So for my kids who have four APs this year or, or two APs and two IVs, don't go take one AP next year because you think it means less than 11th grade. 12th grade may not be as important as 11th grade, but it's still an indication of you being willing to put the most effort forward that we expect of all of our highly selective applicants. So your 12th grade course rigor should match that of 11th grade. The big difference between 11th and 12th grade, 11th grade should be the most rigorous course schedule you can handle. 12th grade should be the most rigorous course schedule of interest to you. Meaning, if you want to take your foot off the pedal in 12th grade, you only want one AP, you're just burnt out, go for it. But you need to understand that for the purposes of today's conversation, that can have an impact on the most likely schools in the nation. To that point, right here, you're going to notice that I put in order of importance what they care about. And I leave class rank in here for a reason. We don't do class rank in Montgomery County. But you need to understand that some schools, they base part of it, uh, they base your class rank above test scores. I only want you to see that just so you get a sense of how little test scores actually mean to these schools. You have no class rank. Yet, if you did, it would mean more than any test score you could provide on the AP or SAT or ACT level. That is how little test scores mean nowadays. So I want you all to hear me when I say this. I don't want anybody on this call spending a hundred hours and ten thousand dollars on test prep to get a fifteen eighty. I'd much rather see you go at it on your own with Khan Academy. Maybe do a couple hours of selected tutoring for a couple hundred dollars to get you to where you want, and then use that test score. Obviously, if we're talking about your Harvards and Yales and whatnot. They want to see uh, around a fourteen eighty plus at the very least. So if you don't have that, we don't submit test scores. That doesn't mean that you go and spend thousands of dollars to get yourself up to the 1500 though, because even if you get there, it may not be the difference maker for them. They've said that they don't care as much about the test scores anymore as they used to. So for my high achievers out there, if you really want to stand out among your peers and, and you don't find yourself to be a good test taker, take a course that's of interest to you in senior year or over summer. Some of my favorite things to do are take a community college course over summer rather than going and paying for one of those pay to play uh, things at UChicago for six weeks and $8,000. Take that $400 course at the local Montgomery College and in, a, in an area of interest to you over paying $6,000 to go to UCLA for four weeks over summer in a summer discovery program, right? They care more about you pursuing your interests and your passions than they do about these test scores or about you meeting a mark that you think is expected of you on that front. The personal rankings are a lot less black and white. From your activities down to the interview that many of these highly selective schools do, it is different. So let's start with the activities. Please. Don't go join the activity, like I said before, because last year's president went to Yale or because you want to spend more time with your buddy Johnny. If that's where you're joining activities, by all means do it, but it's not going to mean anything to these schools. Oftentimes, students will put 10 activities and the last three will be like JV football, quit because I didn't like it. One of them's going to be like, it's, uh, spent one week uh, working at an animal shelter, but decided that when I realized I was allergic to cats, I couldn't work there anymore. The activities you list should be quality, not quantity focused. I'd rather see five very strong activities than eight activities where you kind of jumped around because you didn't know what you want. Because the student has five things that they've done since ninth grade and they love and show that care, that commitment, and that consistency. Those are the kids who show me where they're going to make an impact on my campus. Those are the students who have a high impact on what they do and who leave a lasting legacy. You've heard me use that term already, lasting legacy, and it's because it's important. I'm not telling you that when you leave high school that you need to be able to point to that one thing that's going to remain after you go. But think about the clubs you're involved in. You don't need to be the president of the club to make an impact. You could be the, the, the social chair who has helped it grow from 10 people to 30 people. You, you could start a new club where when you leave, there's might only be four people involved, but it's there because you created it. The impact is what they want from the activities, not the number. Oh, and for the record, activities are not just clubs at school, because I, I did forget to include that. It's a summer job. It's that summer course you take outside of school. It's a hobby of yours that you can't live without. It's something that you and your buddies do over the weekend, uh, where, where, like aqua farming, right? 
My point being activities are anything and everything outside the classroom that are meaningful to you. I've already touched some on the essay and the likelihood is we can do an hour long webinar down the road closer to summer about essays as they become more prevalent. But here's the important thing. Don't write the MIC essay. Don't write the same essay that everybody else does where you think you have to brag about your greatest strength or tell them about how community service taught you the importance of helping others or anything like that. The essay is a chance for me to get to know you in a way I don't yet know. So the four general rules of thumb that I wanna cover quickly, one, be yourself. Don't write and go through the thesaurus trying to find words that you wouldn't use. Write informally and conversationally like a 17 year old. Number two, don't try to impress them, be honest. Open up about it, about a weakness or about an issue. One of my favorite essays ever was about a kid who couldn't stop losing, but how it opened up doors for her to try new things and how resilient it made her. Number three, don't be repetitive. If you've already talked about your love of lacrosse and how you're on the club team and you're on your school team in your uh, activities, don't just go talk about lacrosse because you think I ignored that. Talk about something different. Teach me about you in a way I don't yet know. You can lean on an activity to teach me about you through it, but it shouldn't be the focus of the essay. And number four, own your story. Anybody can talk about how they played an instrument, but after they realized that they weren't good, they tried something else. But if you can talk to me specifically about how you tried to play the oboe, but every time you would play it, you could hear the cat cry in the corner. Dad would come running down the stairs. One time he even fell because it was hurting his ears so bad. Well, to you, it may not matter. It helps us see the greater narrative and picture. So the details that you can include in your stories truly matter. So again, I'd love to spend more time on the essay, but for right now, we're going to keep moving through the other things that college you're looking at as far as your personal rankings go. Alumni interviews. While oftentimes these don't play a huge role, they can if it goes badly. So for those of you who are seniors on this call, who are, who are doing alumni interviews at some of the most selective schools or who are juniors who are going to be doing alumni interviews after you apply this coming fall. Keep the following things in mind. Number one, do not show up late. The people doing these are alumni interviewers for that school and they aren't being paid to do this. They do it because they love their institution. They wanna help build the next class and get to know you. So if you show up 10 minutes late, that's disrespectful of their time. Two, especially if it's online. Don't be doing this the whole time. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's been really cool getting to know you. Focus, just as you would at a job interview or if it was in person, keep a look at them. And if you struggle with that, put something right behind your computer that you can stare at so that it looks like you're making that eye contact, but keep that eye contact. Number three, do not just assume that they know everything in your application and that they're just asking these things because oftentimes the interviewer has no idea about what's in your application. All they know is your name, the high school you come from, and sometimes what your, what your prospective major is. Other than that, the interviewer knows nothing about you. So feel free to reiterate what you've already said in the application so that they can put those notes in there so that it validates what you've already put in your application. And number four, probably the most important, the questions you ask at the end do matter. If they say, do you have any questions? They'll just say, don't buy and slam your computer shut or walk out of the room. Ask them things that are meaningful. Some of my favorite questions include, what is your favorite tradition about Dartmouth or at Princeton? Let them talk about what they loved about their school. Another one I really like to ask, what was your favorite class that you took outside your major that prepared you most for, for life ahead? It shows that you're thoughtful and that you're not just focused on, I'm gonna be a biomed engineering major. And number three, you can always ask them if you want to, what their favorite thing was that they gained out of college. Not from a classroom, but from the perspective of getting to know what it was that they did on that campus. Let them know that you're aware that what happens at school isn't always just about in the classroom, but the connections you make outside of it. So for the most part, interviews don't decide whether or not you get into that school unless you show up 15 minutes late, you're wearing a raggedy shirt, your hair's all over the place, you're not paying attention. In which case they will relay back to the admissions office that you just clearly didn't care and that can have an impact. And the last piece of it is fit, folks. We oftentimes don't think much about this, especially the most selective schools, but the fit matters. You might absolutely love a certain activity or a certain, so, a certain uh, uh, major, but that school doesn't offer it and you're just applying because of the name. Well, what's the point? Are you just applying because of the name? Because if so, they're going to read right through that and they're not going to want you. And you're just going to talk in your essay about walking through the prestigious halls of Dartmouth and they're going to say, okay, we know we're strong, but tell us why you should be here, right? The more 
we look at the schools that we're talking about today, the fit does matter less than some of the less selective schools out there. If you're applying to Yale, Dartmouth, Harvard, and then your backup school is, let's just use uh, uh, UMBC as an example, and then for UMBC, you actually like write the essay, like, and that's why I can't wait to come to Dartmouth, just because you copied and pasted and didn't even notice. Well, a safety school, a school where you should have gone into hands down, is going to say no, because you just made it very clear that you don't care. You didn't even proofread your essay. On the other side of things, let's say that you love to ski and you decide you're going to apply to University of Arizona because you heard they have a good business program and you can get into the honors program and it's a safety school. And then they see your activities are very, like, very northern oriented, northeast, uh, 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 you know, maybe Tahoe, but we don't have this in Arizona. Even if we accept you, it makes it that much harder for us to give you money or honors because you're not a good fit. And even if we accept you, you're going to hurt our yield because you're not going to come. From safety to target to reach. Every school should have a reason other than the name. It should be what it has to offer you and what you have to offer that institution that makes it a cohesive fit. And it's been our folks at College Rice for many years. Our founder wrote a book called Find the Right Fit You because so many people don't take the fit piece into account. And even at the most selective schools, they, it matters. Georgia Tech's a perfect example. I've seen students get into Harvard, but not Georgia Tech. And they go, how could Georgia Tech say no to me when Harvard said yes? Well, just like Georgia Tech and MIT and Caltech, some of the most technically oriented schools in the nation, the student didn't have a lot of background with actually having hands-on robotics experience or engineering experience. They had great grades. They were part of multiple things at school. They were very strong students. But the specific things that Georgia Tech was looking for from their student body that year, the student didn't have. So Georgia Tech said no. And they're like, well, obviously I'm going to Harvard and that's great. But they were still shocked that Georgia Tech said no. It's all about what that institution is looking for. And it's why it matters that you take the time to research each school, understand what they want from their student body, what their student body brings to them, so you can recognize whether or not it's a good fit for you. So we touched a lot on letters of recommendation already. I am going to skip over this slide for the time being, but there is one other thing I wanted to add. You'll notice here that I mentioned personal and academic. We touched on the academic side, but the personal side is also key. Many of us have uh, somebody from our church, a job that we worked at, um, a coach, uh, somebody from our dance team or, or, uh, or um, uh, our music teacher who could speak to us on a personal level that isn't academic. Most of the institutions we're talking about today accept at least one other recommender, meaning it could be somebody who's a coach, a minister, uh, um, an employer. And so you can absolutely ask for another letter of recommendation that speaks to who you are in those settings outside the academic side. So what I'm going to do here is I'm not going to kind of spiel to you about what we do here at CollegeWise. I'd rather actually get over to the questions since it seems like there's quite a few pouring in. So let me do this. If you're interested in learning more about some of the free resources at CollegeWise, go to www.collegewise.com. We have an entire summer planning guide up there for free. We have Project Runway. We have a lot of free options up there for you to learn more about. We don't need to hire anybody. If you are interested in learning about how you can work with me or other counselors like me, you can call Courtney, my program advisor, or email her, or you can email me. My info is on the next slide. But more importantly, I think there's a lot of questions we want to get to. So let me shoot it back to the CAC. So actually, I think we covered a lot of the recommendation questions, which were okay. coming in. And um, Ms. Heald was kind enough to answer the question about whether schools prefer four years of languages or is that, you know, not that important. I think she covered that. But if you have an opinion on it and want to add that, that would be great, too. Sure. I can't see what Ms. Heald said, so I hope that I don't contradict her. But the schools we're talking about today, they want to see a fourth year of language. They don't need to, none of them require it. But it, for example, if you look at Amherst College's uh, webpage, they state on there what they require and what they highly recommend. And of course, highly is italicized and bolded and everything else. And they highly recommend four years of language. Granted, I'm talking about one of the finest liberal arts institutions in the nation. So if you're pursuing chemical engineering at Carnegie Mellon, they're probably not gonna focus too much time on whether or not you had a fourth year of Spanish, German, French, whatever it is. But going back to the love of learning, if you have a fourth year of language, oftentimes you don't do that unless you either like to learn about it or you're willing to challenge yourself. And to us as an institution, that matters. 
Great. So I just put in um, to the chat if anybody has any questions, because from what I can tell going through the questions we've had, I think we've covered it. Um, oh, one just came in. Thank you. Um, how do European schools differ from ones in the United States? I'm assuming in terms of what they're looking for of their applicants. Sure. So it, it's actually twofold uh, for when we're speaking generally, right, because Europe has many different colleges. One of the biggest things is price. The US is one of the most expensive places to go to college. You look at Canada, you have schools like University of Toronto and UBC, or you look at uh, the University of Netherlands or, or, or University de Paris, $20,000 a year. Because in our, in our country, the education system is, I wouldn't say it's backwards, but there's a lot of things that we pay for that we don't necessarily recognize, right? So when you look at the cost of attendance, sometimes you have an extra $5,000 just in room, in room and board just because of the, what, of the dorm that you chose to live in, right? You don't get a lot of that in Europe. So the, the, the pricing tends to be a lot lower. But from the perspective of what they're looking for, they tend to be a lot more academically focused in what they're looking for. Colleges in the US are looking holistically activities, grades, courses, uh, per personality traits. In Europe and UK especially, they're focused on what do you want to study here and how can we get you where you want to be? So the essay you write, the personal statement, isn't about teaching them about you. It's about telling them why you are going to be the best chemistry addition to their chemistry department. Great, thank you for that. Um, just to follow up on the language, um, what preferences, I guess we can say, rather than requirements, when they talk about recommended a four years of language, are they talking about four years in high school or like MCPS allows you to start, you know, language and great six, seven, grade? So glad whoever asked that two stars to you, you, you got to, you, if I could give you a cookie, I'd give you a cookie. Um, now I just want a cookie. Sorry. Uh, so <laughs> if you took Spanish one in seventh grade, Spanish two in eighth grade, Spanish three in ninth grade and Spanish four in 10th grade, perfectly acceptable. Cause that, cause those in seventh and eighth grade, that counted, that was high school level. You were just a bit accelerated. So they don't need to see it in freshman through senior year. They just want to see that by the time you graduate, you had four years of high school level. Great, um, thank you for that. Um, then a question came in, I guess they, somebody wants to understand why is it that it's more important to get, for instance, a STEM teacher recommendation instead of others or, you know, why, why is it so important to get that junior year teacher recommendation? The why behind what you're sure. saying. Sure, <laughs> I'm happy to kind of, since we have some time here, and by the way, if we're running out of time, cut me off because I tend to talk a lot, as you can tell. Um, let, let's dive into this. 11th grade is the most recent year as to when you're applying. So let's say you had a great 10th grade uh, AP world teacher, right? And you got along really well. Well, if I'm, a, if I'm a selective institution and you submit that to me, it's going to look good because they're going to speak highly of you, but it's going to beg two questions. One, why didn't you ask someone from 11th grade? What changed for you so much, so drastically that somebody who's gotten to know you even more recently as you've matured, as you've grown, as you've become stronger and more academic, why wouldn't we ask them, right? So it is a question mark. Sometimes I have had students fight back and say, my 10th grade teacher knows me so well that they could actually tell you X, Y, and Z about me. Nobody else could. By all means, ask that 10th grade, but I always recommend you have at least one from the most recent year of school, because otherwise it does beg the question, why was there nobody from the most recent year of high school? You have these three or four A's and, or five A's or six A's, but we didn't ask a single one of them. What happened? You want to avoid any questions on their end. Now to the subject line, it's all dependent on what you want to pursue academically. If you decide you want to be a history major and you get a letter of recommendation from your English and your Spanish teacher, great. But if you're going to pursue something STEM oriented, you likely want to have at least one person who can speak to who you were in a classroom that was more technical, like chemistry, biology, physics, calculus, statistics, right? And if we don't have a single one of those, it makes me wonder why. And MIT even states it on their website. They require that most of their applicants have one from a science and one from a math teacher. They aren't messing around, right? They, they want these STEM-oriented ones because of how STEM-oriented their school is. So I'm not telling students that they have to get one math, one English, one STEM, one humanities. I'm saying that for many students who, are, who apply to these schools who stand out, having one from each side of the aisle can help unless you are so technically focused in the STEM world or so humanities focused that it doesn't make sense for you to ask somebody on the other side of the aisle. I think that answers the question, but if it begs others, please let me know. 
Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, so somebody has a very, I guess, opinion based question, and it's a little bit out of the realm of what we're discussing in terms of what you need to get in. But they're asking, well, are these highly selective colleges that we're all talking about this? Is that price tag worth it? Um, <laughs> you know, especially if you can't get the need based aid. So and I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can comment in the chat box here. Like I said, folks, there's a video by Malcolm Gladwell called Zeitgeist. And I'm going to go ahead and pull it up right now just so I can share it in there uh, so that people who are interested can click on it. He speaks directly to that. The price tag that we pay nowadays, for the most part, may not be worth it. That isn't to say it isn't worth going to Harvard if you get in. But you do have to ask yourself some of the following questions, right? First off, and, and most importantly, in my opinion, is what will this do to your family finances? Is dad or is mom going to take on a second job? Are you going to be in debt for 30 years? Because if so, why is that beneficial to you, right? And second question, for many people who are thinking that way, they're like, well, I want to go to Yale because I want to be able to get into the best pre med medical school. Well, folks, Yale's going to cost you $240,000. Med school is then going to cost another three fifty. dollars You just put yourself into half a million dollars worth of debt so that you could, what now? The very first year that I was a counselor, I had a student who decided not to attend a highly selective institution because of financial purposes. They actually ended up going to Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, and they went down there for, for, a net, for an engineering uh, opportunity. All expenses paid. The only thing they would have to pay for is their travel to and from school, and that was a drive for them. So it was gas and then sometimes like a, a, a night out with their friends. In his first semester of senior year at VCU, he was offered a six-figure job from Cisco as a network engineer. That doesn't happen unless you're willing to take advantage of the opportunities given to you. So like I said at the beginning of this, great things don't happen just at prestigious institutions. They happen everywhere. And there's one thing that I hope that all of you will take away this evening. It's that what you do is more important than where you go. I've seen students go to Yale, graduate. Six months later, they're still without a job, living at home with their parents, trying to figure out what to do. And, and maybe they do Teach for America because they just need to do something. Their time, they're so bored. And you know what? I've also seen kids go to Yale and end up getting into UPenn's uh, Wharton School, right? Like it does go both ways. But I've also seen students go to Eastern Carolina and end up going to Wharton's Business School or UPenn's Wharton Business School, right? So again, the price tag isn't the end all be all. The amount that you pay should not be correlated to the name of the school. The amount you, you pay should be correlated to the opportunities you see ahead of you at that school. Um, so a, a follow-up on that um, in terms of where to go, is it worth the money? Um, it, it, would it be harmful? And I guess maybe harmful, I don't know if that's the word that we want to use, but would it be a disadvantage to go to an international school in terms of networking? Or I guess I'm thinking, uh, let's expand on that question, um, in terms of getting to graduate schools in America, if you want to do graduate schools. So very good question. It rarely plays a role as far as the graduate school piece. If you go to, let, let's use uh, the University of Kyoto in, in Japan, and you decide after that to apply to a school like UVA's business school, they actually love that. They love the diversity. They love kind of what taking a, a strong student from one of those institutions and seeing what they gain there because it allows them a more diverse and full class, one where everyone's going to work together. In fact, it's actually hard to get into UVA's business school if you went to UVA than if you went elsewhere, right? Because they want that diversity. Where it can become harder to your question is in networking. Let's say you go to the University of Tokyo or Kyoto, right? And then you come back to the US. Well, there may not be as many representatives kind of in this in the areas you move to from that school. But if you were able to get an opportunity at a Fortune 500 company over summer through the connections you made at Kyoto and through the work you did, that should speak for itself. You'll be able to go and sit in front of an interview and say, I get it. You probably have inter people interviewing from Yale, Harvard, et cetera. But did they get six months experience at, at uh, Ernst & Young kind of under X, uh, under X AVP and able to show kind of this amount of work done already? A lot of the time, no. So it's actually, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the school Northeastern in Boston. Northeastern over the past 30 years has built a name for itself off their co-op program. There are two other schools in the US who have really good co-op programs, Drexel University, Georgia Tech. The co-op program allows students to get really good hands-on experience in college. So either a semester or two semesters, either in the US or outside the US, based on your interest, based on your major, you're working during that time. 
the money you're paying isn't going to Northeastern, it's going to the housing or whatever it may be to feed you if it's an unpaid internship during that time. But you graduate with more experience than students who went to the Ivies and end up beating them out for the jobs. And it's why Northeastern has seen a drop from 48% admit rate to 17% in 25 years. It's a huge drop, but it's because of the success of their student body and the opportunities being afforded to them. That is good to know. It, it actually, and if I'm not mistaken, and maybe you could talk to this, I remember in one of our other um, wonderful events that uh, Ms. Heald put together, um, there was talk about how getting into graduate schools, sometimes actually the percentages coming out of non Ivy League schools, but for things like, you know, the colleges that form that colleges that change lives, actually, the, the statistics of admissions to graduate programs like medical school are actually higher. Mm -hmm. Is that your understanding as well? It's not just my understanding, it's a fact. It's so think of it this way. Many students who go to Yale, Harvard, MIT, a lot of the time they actually end up graduating. And while they get good jobs, they find themselves struggling after their time there because it was so much work, it was so much effort that they need time away. Whereas a student might have gone to ECU, Northern Oklahoma, uh, Iowa State, University of Maryland. And during that time, they were not only able to gain everything they wanted to in the classroom, but really get to know themselves more, figure out what it is they want, instead of being in a pressure cooker where coming out of it, they knew what they wanted to pursue and they went right into a master's program or they pursued med school or law school. So for many students, the reason that that number is higher is because they didn't put themselves in a position where they needed time away from the classroom after it because of how much stress it put on them. Thank you for that. Um, and then going a little bit, uh, shifting a little bit our focus in terms of what's your advice about submitting supplemental art materials? Great question. I just saw it come through. Uh, so there's a couple things. One, keep in mind that for many schools, they use something called Blackboard. Uh, so, uh, so what you'll do is you will submit through a separate portfolio. That means that when you're applying, like if you go to Yale, uh, when you're on the Common App, you click, are you interested in submitting an art portfolio? You'll click yes. They'll have you create a new, a new link and you'll do all of it through there. So it's somewhere where you can upload, whether it's music, art, uh, whatever it may be, you can upload your pieces there and submit it. If you're putting in a portfolio, oftentimes it means that you might be pursuing that as a major. So while the admissions office at that institution will review your application, your portfolio will be reviewed by the art department, by the music department, because they'll be able to know better. Because let's be honest, I bet you, Allison, if you submitted your art portfolio to me, I'd say, that's beautiful. Oh my gosh, look what you've done. But I can't paint. I can't even draw stick figures. Don't make fun of me. I can't. So it wouldn't be fair of me to judge yours. That's why a lot of the time those extra supplemental uh, pieces will go to the actual departments that would be able to kind of look at it and say, hmm, here's where their strengths are, here's where their weaknesses are, here's what we like versus dislike. So to answer the question, my advice, make sure you don't wait until October to start putting them together. Start putting those together now. You can start your common application today. Only the basic information under the common app tab. Profile, family, education, testing, activities, the, self, the, the personal statement under writing, all that rolls over, but everything else resets August 1st. But come August 1st of this year, for my ju juniors who are going to be seniors, you'll be able to start adding in your specific colleges, seeing what it is that they're allowing you to put in. For the schools that allow for an art portfolio, I would start building it out around August time rather than waiting until October because the stress will pick up. Thank you so much. Um, as far as I can tell, I think we've addressed most of the questions either through the chat or by yours. Um, and I'll give K Kate, I will mute myself so Kate can um, do all the ending messages. <laughs> Sorry, I was sending a message in the chat. So I apologize um, profusely for the beginning of this Zoom tonight. Um, thank you. Jordan, so much for your flexibility with this and accommodating us. And oops, and Marina, thank you so much for you know just uh, getting this second Zoom uh, going. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So it's something I will address with um, MCPS because we will be doing other workshops with Jordan. Um, I met Jordan at uh, Walter Johnson when my daughter was a student there and he was presenting and I was working at a, a different MCPS school, but I was so impressed with him that I, I stole him away and um, had met, 
introduced him to Marina and the rest of the um, College Advisory Committee. And so I'm so excited that he's gonna be working with BCC. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, I am Kate Heald and I'm the College and Career Advisor at BCC High School. Um, please reach out to me um, and I can connect you with Jordan, but he will be doing summer workshops. We've already talked about some of the summer workshops that we're gonna be doing. Um, we just have to iron out dates and we'll get all that information to you. So again, thank you all so much for being flexible tonight. I really appreciate it. And, and Jordan, Kate, thank you thank for you. managing yes. that stress better than anybody else. Kind of getting back to us and whatnot. It's, it, I know that wasn't easy. You made this still happen. We were only 10 minutes late. We're still finishing on time. So thank you for working well under pressure. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody. And this will be recorded. I'll be sending it out through Naviance and I'll be posting it on the um, Career Center website. And I know that Marina is going to be posting it on the College and Career Center, I mean, College Advisory Committee website as well. So thank you.